And to have the wonderful opportunity to be sharing a platform with her is honour indeed. Because I think of the work she has done over the years has been some of the most amazing and consistent work mm. that's trying to understand exactly what is taking place in the near-death experience. Rather than just discussing experiences that people have, it's more of an approach to try and understand exactly what is taking place and also the changes that take place in individuals after they've experienced near-death experiences. So I'd just like to hand over very quickly to Penny to introduce herself and tell us a little bit about herself. Okay, hi. Thanks everyone for turning up here today. For those of you who don't know me, I used to work as a nurse and I was in intensive care for 17 years. And it was very early on in my nursing career that I had an encounter with a patient who was dying and that really made me question what happens when we die. This, this man had a very prolonged and suffering death and it, it was something that greatly upset me and it made me realize that we, we don't understand the dying process. And I started reading about death because there were no courses available and I came across near-death experiences. And I thought, now this is interesting. These people are saying that death is nothing to be afraid of and that it's a wonderful experience. And at first, I think I was a little bit sceptical because my nurse training had never talked about these experiences and I'd always been led to believe that they were some sort of hallucination. But the more I read about them, the more interested I became. And I can remember when I was a student nurse, I'd been looking after a lady for 10 days in a row. And on the final day, she said to me, I went to heaven. And I said, oh, did you? And she said, yes. And she said, when I was in the coronary care unit, I had a heart attack. And she said, I left my body. And I was floating around, looking ar around from above. And then she said, I went into this beautiful place. And it was a lovely garden. And my mother was in this garden. And she, she sent me back. She said, I shouldn't be there. And she said, all of a sudden, I could hear a voice saying, she's coming around. We've got her. And that was the voice of the doctor. And I opened my eyes and I was back in the coronary care unit. At the time, I listened to her, but I didn't question her because I had this preconception that it was some sort of hallucination. Now, over 20 years later, I'm kicking myself that I didn't ask her more questions. So that was the first time I'd heard about them. And I think when I started doing my research then, I realized how important it is to listen to patients and hear what they have to say. So that's a little bit about my background. So, Anthony? Okay. From my point of view, I've been intrigued by the border areas of human consciousness and how we interface with reality for probably nigh on 30 years. And it was only in recent years that I've really started to focus in on the near-death experience, the out-of-body experience, lucid dreaming, and other areas of that overlap that we have between everyday reality and external reality. Now, for most people, um, I think the altered states of consciousness take place in the hypnagogic states, which is just before you go to sleep, and the hypnopompic states just before you wake up, where you see images in your mind and these kind of things. But the near-death experience is, is qualitatively different to that. And one of the things that we'll discover as we start talking through here, we'll find that there's actually objective and verifiable evidence that individuals, when they are in out-of-body states during near-death experiences, can actually perceive information that would be impossible for them to do so had they been embodied in the sense of the being embodied within the brain, which suggests that near-death experiences are evidence of the fact that we are not brain embodied. The brain is like a receiver of information, effectively from a field, which we'll be discussing a little bit later. But what I'd like to do now is, I know from Penny's research, she has some fascinating cases 
that I think if you haven't read about them, they will intrigue and fascinate you. So Penny, of all the cases that you've dealt with, I think patient 10 was the most intriguing of all. Yeah, Can you definitely. tell everybody about it? Um, patient 10 was the strongest case in my study. With my study, what I did was, is this annoying you, this mic? It's annoying me. All right, okay. Um, patient 10, uh, it was the strongest case in my study. So with my research, I interviewed for the first year everyone who survived their admission to the intensive care unit. Now, not all of these people came close to death, but I wanted to see if there was a specific illness that was influencing the experience or uh, other different experiences. Maybe just the thought of being in intensive care in itself could make a, a patient think that they were sicker than they were, and is that a trigger for the experience? But what I found at the end of the first year, I, was, I didn't have enough time to, to follow up the patients. It was all done in my spare time, and so basically, at the end of every shift, I'd go to the ward to, to interview people. So the, for the next four years, I concentrated only on people who'd survived cardiac arrest. And so I found that the ones who'd survived cardiac arrest, it was a smaller sample, but there were far more people who had a near-death experience. What I found was patient 10, he had this experience one day while I was looking after him. So this is quite a unique case because I was actually there. At the time, I didn't realize he was having a near-death experience. We, this man had been in intensive care for a while. He was making a very good recovery and we decided to sit him in the chair. He was still ventilated at the time, but it's very good for the, the patient's breathing and for their posture if we get them out into the chair. He didn't want to go in the chair. He'd argued with the physio and the sister, but he did sit there. And as soon as he sat there, I could see his breathing pattern had changed. He looked very uncomfortable. And then the cardiac monitor actually alarmed that his oxygen levels were a bit low. So I got what we call an ambu bag, connected it to the oxygen point and to his tracheostomy and squeezed in extra oxygen. And that resolved that problem. But then very quickly, his heart rate went into a very fast rhythm, very briefly, and then his blood pressure started to drop, and it was getting quite low, so I was getting concerned. And then he's, he went grey and clammy, and that was the, the sign of an ensuing cardiac arrest. So I gathered my colleagues, we literally got him back into bed, by which time he was deeply unconscious. He wasn't responding to deep, painful stimuli. If you press on the sternum, sometimes the patient will move like that. If you press a pen into the nail bed, sometimes they will move their arm away. But he was doing none of that. He was deeply unreactive, deeply unconscious. The doctor came and reviewed him, gave him some fluid for his blood pressure. That resolved. The doctor had to go back to another emergency. About 10 minutes later, the blood pressure started to drop again. So I ran into the corridor to look for another doctor, and the consultant happened to be walking on that day. He came over and he examined the patient. We gave him some more fluid. He checked his pupils. He shone a pupil torch into his eyes. And then after about half an hour, the patient started to um, move his arms like this in his, his legs, and he started to flicker his eyelids. So everyone was happy that he was regaining neurological function. So the consultant went back into his office and the patient then continued to make a recovery. About four hours later, as the ward round were approaching his bed, this man regained full consciousness and he was very animatedly and excitedly trying to tell the doctors something. I wasn't there at the time, I was actually on the ward interviewing another patient. When I came back, the doctors were there and they said, you need to go and speak to this patient now. And he said um, he couldn't talk because of the tracheostomy. He got a letter board. The, the physiotherapist got him a letter board. And it said, he spelled out, I died, and I watched it all from above. So the consultant said, oh, you'd better tell Penny about that. And he, the doctor actually noted this in his medical notes, that he regained consciousness and reported a near-death experience. So that in itself was quite a breakthrough, because I think the doctors now are starting to take on board these experiences. So the patient described leaving his body, and he was up above, and he was looking down on his body as well. 
He very accurately described myself as cleaning his mouth with something long and pink, which I'd done. I had a, a pink lollipop sponge. Uh, first of all, I'd, he'd dribbled from the side of his mouth, and so I cleaned that up with a suction catheter and then put a, a pink lollipop into his mouth and freshened it up. So he described me doing that. He described the consultant as having examined him and looked in his eyes. And this is unusual because the, the consultant hadn't been around before he'd lost consciousness. So he hadn't seen the consultant that morning. He only saw him on the ward round later on. And he also described the physiotherapist looking very nervous and poking a head around the curtains. And this actually happened. And all of these things happened when he was deeply unconscious. So further to that as well, he then described going into a pink room. And in this pink room was his dead father, and he was really pleased to see him. Um, and he said there was a man next to his dead father. And he said, I'm not sure who this man was. It could have been Jesus, but it's not what I would expect Jesus to look like, because his hair was long and scruffy, and it needed a good comb in. And he said, um, <laughs> he also had very piercing eyes. And he said, I was drawn to look at his eyes. I just wanted to look at his eyes. And um, then he, he, there was another woman there, and he said, that was my dead mother-in-law. He'd never met her, but he recognized her from photos. And then he said, I, I was so happy. All my pain had gone, and I wanted to stay there. But this Jesus-type figure said, no, it's not your time. You have to go back. And with that, he started drifting backwards into his body, and that image just faded in front of him. And he said, all of a sudden, I was back in my body, and as soon as I entered my body, I was in excruciating pain. And he said, it was so painful, I really wished that I was dead. And an interesting aspect of this case is something that I missed, I, I could have missed it quite easily. He misinterpreted one of my questions when I'd followed him up with the interview. And this man has cerebral palsy. He's 60 years of age at the time of his experience, and his right hand was always in a permanently contracted position like this. He had very minimal movement before, and he misinterpreted one of my questions. And he said, oh yeah, look, I can open up my hand fully. Now, I didn't realize the significance of that at the time, but when I went back and asked the doctors and the physiotherapists, they said that shouldn't be possible because his hand, the tendons would be in that permanently contracted position. So to open out his hand, he would have to have an operation to release the tendons. So I went and I double checked on his notes to see if he'd had extensive hand physiotherapy or something like that, but I couldn't explain it and the doctors couldn't explain it otherwise. So that was a very important aspect because I think if we understood the mechanism for that, there are so many other people out there with similar conditions. Maybe we could employ some sort of technique that would help them to open out their hand as well. So I think it's important to take these cases on board and rather than just kind of dismiss them, which is what they have been up until recently, I think it's important to investigate them further as well so we can learn more from them. So that was the strongest case that I came across. Just as a question there, it was one of the intriguing points, playing devil's advocate. Effectively, he was in a very, very low state in, mentally in terms mm -hmm. he, he was in a deep, deep hypnotic, uh, it was a deep state, mental state. Yeah. Could he have seen, you know the object you describe as the lollipop, mm -hmm. could he have seen that object as part and parcel of the bits and pieces and the paraphernalia of the, mm -hmm. the resuscitation unit? Yeah, he could have, and that's a good question because he'd been in intensive care for a while. So he knew the kind of routine, and he knows that I cleaned his mouth previously with a, a pink sw a sponge as well. So that is something from memory. So that's, you know, you have to take these things on board when you try to investigate them. And is it that he was just feeling what I was doing to him and picking it up from that? But the interesting thing is that the physiotherapist, she was poking her head around the curtains and looking at him, but her, his eyes were closed at that point, and she was out of his line of vision. So how do we explain that? I know? think in that whole case, that's the most powerful element mm -hmm. when I first read it, was this idea that the, 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 well, it came across in your book, the desperation of the physiotherapist and how mm -hmm. worried she was yes, that she was it. somehow responsible for causing mm -hmm. this guy 
to, to have an, um, an experience that could have killed him. Mm -hmm. But effectively, if he was lying down or had he had his eyes closed, there's one thing to say that he could feel something in his mouth, and it's reasonable mm -hmm. to conclude he could have confabulated from that the object. But being able to physically see, and as I understand, it was one of those kind of wards where you pull mm -hmm. the curtains all the way around. That's right, yes. So he couldn't have seen outside, but he was very much aware of the fact. Now, this mm -hmm. reminds me of a case, the Pin Van Lommel case with the mm -hmm. dentures. That's right, yeah. Where there was a man in a hospital in the Netherlands who uh, was brought in in a state of deep hypothermia. Now, of course, mm -hmm. with hypothermia, the brain actually goes into a, a sort of a semi-comatose state just because of the cold because they actually go, it goes into a very deep state of unconsciousness. But effectively, when this guy was brought in, they took his dentures out so that he could breathe more easily. I guess they were trying to put something Probably down his throat. Probably when they were intubating. But effectively, when he came to, and when he did recover, one of the first things he pointed out was where his dentures were. Mm -hmm. So clearly here we have some kind of other ability to, to see things mm -hmm. that you can't normally th see through our normal sensory apparatus, which suggests that the brain somehow can elicit information from somewhere else. Mm -hmm. The also interesting unit about this was the idea of a point of consciousness mm -hmm. looking down. Now, I've been doing talks for many years on near-death experiences to audiences like yourselves, and the amount of times that individuals will be in that audience and we'll have a discussion, like we will later after we finish this, when Penny and I finish talking, we'll put it out to you guys, where people will turn around and say, I've had a near-death experience. They will describe exactly the type of typologies, even though they've never read books necessarily on near-death mm -hmm. experiences. So it seems that what's known as the moody traits, which are the, the kind of the typologies we use to describe a near-death experience, people follow. For instance, one lady told me that she'd never told anybody before, but during childbirth, she'd had a near-death experience. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the major criticisms or excuses made for near-death experiences is, is that near-death experiences mm -hmm. is your way when you're in a traumatic situation that you don't want to physically be there. It's disassociation. In other words, you're in a terrible situation, you're in pain, what do you do? Like a child does, you think yourself out of your body and want to be somewhere else viewing the circumstances. Now, as Penny quite rightly says in her book, that's all well and good, but effectively, when you're in a state of childbirth, the last thing you want to be is in a state of disassociation because you're giving birth to a new life. Mm -hmm. So you don't want to be disassociated at all. You want to actually be part of it. So these are some very interesting questions that people, when they work in this, this, this field, need to talk about. Now, the next thing I'd like to talk to Penny about, or Penny to tell us something, is something called Peking Darian experiences. Now, Peking Darian experiences, it's called this because it's quite, it's quite an interesting background. When um, I think it was Shelley wrote the poem mm -hmm. about Cortez discovering the Pacific Ocean and seeing the Pacific Ocean, he saw the Pacific Ocean from a peak in Darien in Central America. And it's the idea of seeing over into another place, into another zone. And it's been known since the late 1890s when the Society for Psychical Research started using this term are called peak in Darien experiences. And effectively what they are, they're experiences where somebody see somebody in a near-death scenario when they don't know that person has already died. Now, Penny has a classic case of this, mm -hmm. of somebody who did exactly this, so if you'd like to... Um, you're talking about patient 19, yes. is it? Yes. yes. Now, in my study, um, it was a night shift, and I can remember one of the patients was expected to die, and it was during the night his condition had deteriorated. So we'd pho phoned his, his family and said, look, He's taken a turn for the worse, you better come in and see. So they came in and he'd been like that for quite some time and they stayed with him for about an hour and a half and his condition started to stabilise. So they said, look, we're really tired, we're going to go home and we'll be back tomorrow. So the family went home and this was about four o'clock in the morning and my colleague, she tapped me on the shoulder and she said, oh, look, look at him. And we watched him and there was a few of my colleagues watched him as well. He suddenly kind of woke up and he was looking at someone and he started smiling and he looked really, really happy. And he was communicating with someone in front of him who we couldn't see, there was no one there. But he was going, what are you doing here? What are you doing here? And he was smiling and talking and that lasted for about half an hour. We all watched him and every one of us commented on how at peace he looked. And uh, 
the following day, his family came in to visit him, and he said, you'll never guess what happened in the night. My mother and my grandmother were here visiting me, and he said, guess who was with them? My sister. Now, I don't know, what was she doing there? I don't know why she was with them. And he didn't know this, but his sister had actually died the week before, but the family hadn't told him because they didn't want to set back his recovery and upset him. So that was something that really kind of intrigued me because we witnessed him having this conversation and he was quite adamant that his sister had been there with his mother and his uh, grandmother as well. So that was a really interesting case there. Show.